this web app uh, web app uh, that I'm using. But uh, hey, what's going on, everyone? Welcome to another Read Z Live, our ongoing series of webinars where we bring on professionals from the world of publishing to teach you how to write and publish better books. Uh, I'm Martin from the Read Z team based here in London. As you can tell by all these casual London landmarks uh, around me, uh, I'm really pleased to welcome you all today to a, another team webinar. Uh, our last couple of ones, uh, we had one on characters, specifically on a genre. And that genre, if it is a genre, I guess that's the first question I'll be asking, uh, is middle grade. Um, I won't uh, dare sort of uh, give any definitions for that right now because I know we're going to go into that uh, during the talk. But thank you all for being here. Uh, we're just going to wait for a couple of minutes uh, for the hour to hit, and then uh, I'm going to invite my guest on. Uh, she is today Michelle Schusterman, uh, who is a ghostwriter here at Reed Z, but she's also uh, an acclaimed and very prolific uh, author of middle grade books. Um, so she's going to come on and uh, talk to us uh, about working middle grade, writing middle grade, uh, and for some of you, uh, crucially, selling middle grade books. Uh, while we're waiting, uh, tell me where you're from. Uh, I'll read it out here in the uh, comments and uh, see who's about. Uh, Kim says, hi, Martin. Hello, Kim. Hello, Catherine. Uh, I'm glad uh, people are returning week on week. Uh, always glad to see some familiar names. Kim is uh, writing the children's book now. Uh, very much looking forward to this. Well, you know, I've got to show some of these comments. Uh, CEO says, uh, loves her some Reedsy webinars. Who doesn't? Especially psyched to support her girl, Michelle. Uh, so Michelle's waiting in the in the uh, in the wings. So uh, maybe you know CEO. Uh, we've got some other folks. Oh, Caro Brown's got the best advice for everyone, which is uh, to hit the like button. Uh, it does help this video get seen. Uh, it helps me uh, meet my end of year goals. And uh, who knows? Maybe if we get enough likes on this, uh, uh, I don't know. I'll get a raise or something. Who knows? Probably not. Don't worry. Don't worry about that. I don't want to put that kind of pressure on you guys. Uh, we have. Uh, that are, ooh, things are coming in thick and fast. We have the misplaced misfit, KJ Pierce from Florida. Well, welcome, someone from Maine, Glenn Nock. Uh, Susan from Austin, Texas. Uh, well, oh, a fair few Texans here, but of course, yeah, as I've been talking to uh, my guest about just offline, uh, Texas is a, it's a big old state. Michelle herself, uh, uh, I believe didn't ask, but she lives in Texas. I assume she is a Texan. Um, the one thing I know about Texas is apparently Whataburger is good. Um, we'll see. I've only really been to LA, so they tell me that in and out is where it's at. Uh, ben Gartner, author of the MG series The Eye of Ra. Exciting. Uh, we have Mags from North Carolina prepping uh, a novel to be written in November. Uh, we have uh, S. Volkov from Connecticut. OK, so we're seeing a lot of love from North America. Uh, but earlier on, I saw some people from elsewhere, someone from Cape Town, a bunch of people from here in the UK. Mark Hems, hi from London. Hi, indeed. Myself as well. Wordworks from India. Fantastic. Thank you. I know it's something about uh, something like half past midnight where you are, so I appreciate you staying up late. Is anyone coming uh, anywhere further east? Is it later for anyone than, uh, than India? Uh, Portland Jones, not from Portland, but from Birmingham. Not Birmingham, Alabama, Birmingham, England. Uh, Wilder Bellamy uh, from New Jersey. Uh, yeah, I don't recognize that name. Uh, so, yeah, it is now 8 o'clock where I am, 3 p.m. on the East Coast, uh, midday in the Pacific, 12.30 uh, in India, 3 a.m. in Hong Kong and Singapore, and 5 a.m. in Auckland and Sydney. Uh, so, why not? Uh, let's bring on our guest, ladies and gents. Please welcome, live from Texas, Michelle Schusterman. Uh, now I say this and then it takes like two seconds for, oh, <laughs> you know. Hi guys. <laughs> hey, Michelle, so uh, where precisely in Texas are you right now? I am in Dallas. Ah, fantastic. Where um, it's 100 Dallas. billion degrees. <laughs> oh, it is that way everywhere. I don't know of anywhere, anyone in the Northern Hemisphere right now who's going, you know what, this is quite nice. I oh God, nice. so <laughs> it's brutal. <laughs> but uh, you know, I've decided to wear a jacket just to sort of dress up for this because if I don't dress up for you guys, what am I going to dress up for these days? <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, we'll maybe give it a minute or so, but uh, unless unless you talk about it in your presentation, uh, do you want to talk a bit about your background? Sure thing, yeah. Um, so I actually, I used to be a public school teacher. Um, that was kind of my first job right out of college. And then I was a travel and food writer for a few years. And then... Um, it's a long, ridiculous story, but 
I was living abroad and I ended up actually getting tuberculosis and pneumonia and I had to quarantine myself. <laughs> and that was when I started writing books. And I thought maybe I could get a career in writing going because I was confined to my bed and all I could do was sit on my laptop and write. Um, and so that was when I started really working on my first novel. A few years later, I got a literary agent. Um, my first series came out in 2014. And since then I've published, I think I have 13 novels under my own name out. Um, and I've got a couple more under contract. One's coming out in a few weeks, um, another one in December. So yeah, <laughs> a career was born from illness. <laughs> wow, and, uh, so we've almost come full circle. Yeah. <laughs> um, one of the things, uh, Michelle has her own YouTube channel in these, uh, in, in these, uh, in the description below. I've got a link to that. So. Uh, if you like what you see, make sure you click through on that and subscribe. Uh, how often do you put out videos? Uh, Monday and Friday. Right, really? So yeah. we'll do something uh, later in the week. Uh, all right. So I see we have 310 people watching right now, and yet only with, yet only 76 likes. So uh, oh God, thank you. <laughs> this ratio is not good. Okay, maybe we'll have to actually deliver something before they'll give us a like. But um, <laughs> I'll be off in the wings. Uh, for you folks at home, we're going to have a QA and a at the end. So keep the questions coming. Uh, ask them again at the end, and uh, yeah, Michelle, I'll see you later on. Have fun. Oh, great, thank you. <laughs> oh, guys, I'm so excited to be here. So I actually have a fancy little slideshow for you guys today, um, all about, yay, the magic of middle grade fiction. I want to cover three broad topics. The first is going to be the difference between middle grade and YA, because that's a question that I get a ton, and it's while it is about the protagonist's age, it's actually a little bit more complicated than that. Um, I also want to cover content in middle grade, like what, what you can and can't, and I'm using air quotes here, right? As far as issues go, as far as language, as far as romance and things like that. And I want to end with a little section on marketing, especially marketing middle grade novels in 2020, because this year is special <laughs> and we're all having to adapt. So I have some tips and pointers for you there as well. So if we're, we're going to get into it, let's go to the first slide. And let's talk about middle grade versus YA. I actually wanted to start with a little story for you guys. So in 2015, I finished a draft of a middle grade novel and I was super excited about it. And I sent it to a critique partner of mine. This critique partner had been an agent for like 10 years. She was super knowledgeable about middle grade and young adult. And I was so excited to get feedback from her. So she took a few days to read it. And then she was like, can we just meet up for coffee and talk about this instead of me giving you notes? And I was like, yeah, that'd be great. So we meet up and she, started talking about how much she loved the premise, she loved the world, she loved the characters, she was saying all this nice stuff, and I started to think, okay, the ax is about to fall. <laughs> so sure enough, she finally paused and she took a deep breath and she said, okay, can I be honest? And I was like, yes, please. And she said, okay, this book is not middle grade. This book is young adult. And I should mention that at this point, I had published two middle grade series already. So this was not like new territory for me. I thought I knew the difference, <laughs> but my instinctive response to what she said was, but my characters are 12. But even as I said that, I knew she wasn't really commenting on their ages. She was commenting on their journeys, their choices, their mindsets, their actions, and the way they viewed the world in the story. So we sat and talked about this for hours. And by the time I left that cafe, I knew she was right. My book had the narrative voice, like the storytelling style of a middle grade novel, but the characters were in young adult territory. So I had to make a choice. Either way, it was gonna be a big rewrite. <laughs> um, was I gonna do it middle grade or was I gonna do it young adult? It was a really tough lesson to learn. I mean, that was an 80,000 word draft of a book that I had to completely rewrite from scratch. So I'm hoping that this advice that I'm gonna share with you will save you from the same scenario. So next slide, if you don't mind. Awesome. Um, slide three, there we go. So the basics. Middle grade protagonists do tend to be between 10 and 13 years old. And the main character of young adult novels are between 15 and 18 years old. There are always exceptions, but this is the general rule. The 14-year-old characters 
kind of inhabit the dead zone. <laughs> I know authors with shelved manuscripts that receive nothing but rejections because their 14 year old main characters weren't quite tween enough or teen enough. It was just too on the line. And in my opinion, that's a good reason to publish more of those stories because that's, that's such a crucial, difficult age. And it's great to have stories like that out in the world. But there is a chain at work here. Agents want editors to buy their books and editors want booksellers to shelve their books and booksellers have to know where to shelve those books. And now I'm just speaking for the US here and you guys can tell me in the comments if it's different in your countries, but um, in the US at bookstores, middle grade lives in the children's section of the bookstore and young adult has a whole other section that often is nowhere near the children's section so it really is important to booksellers to be able to make this distinction and if it's important to booksellers it's important all the way down the chain so the age of the protagonist does often provide the answer as to whether it's middle grade or young adult but there are lots of ex uh, exceptions like the curious incident of the dog in the nighttime if you've read that that has a 15 year old protagonist but it's shelved in the adult section and Liesel is the nine-year-old main character of the book thief but I have found that in the middle grade section the young adult section and the adult section of various bookstores his dark materials that trilogy revolves around an 11 year old girl and a 12 year old boy um, with a significant amount of page time given to adult characters um, and I've seen it shelved as young adult and middle grade. So you can see there's like, there's a little more to it than just the age of your protagonist. Next slide. <laughs> um, so as my critique partner pointed out that day in the cafe, it isn't about the physical age of your protagonist, it's about their emotional age. A middle grade protagonist is discovering how they fit into the world. A young adult protagonist is discovering how they can change and affect the world. In that draft of my, what I thought was a middle grade book that my critique partner read, my main characters fell into the latter category, into young adults. I said in the book that they were 12, but emotionally and mentally speaking, they were older than that. And it showed in the decisions and the choices they made throughout the book. And that was what my critique partner had pointed out to me. So another way to think about this is how your protagonist relates to the idea of home and what home means to them. I use in all of my courses on teaching specifically how to write Kidlet, I use Cheryl Klein's book, The Magic Words. I highly recommend it to you if you're looking for another writing craft book and you write middle grade or young adult. It is a brilliant masterclass. Um, so in that book, she has two things to say about middle grade protagonists and young adult protagonists. Next slide. <laughs> Um, middle grade protagonists, this is a quote from her book, there we go, middle grade protagonists are acquiring some independence, certainly, but they still need the anchor that home and all it represents provides. When they participate in a grand adventure, it usually ends with the promise of a return home to a safe space, the status quo. If their family or home situation is a bad one, they'll want to find a new home as they're looking for security, not seeking to strike out on their own. In general, if a novel focuses strongly on its protagonist's relationship to his family, school, or animals, or if the protagonist is an animal, then my first instinct will be that it belongs in middle grade. And now on to the next slide. Meanwhile, young adult protagonists are interested in the world beyond home. Friends, romance, and sex, independence, travel, the future. Most times the protagonist's driving ambition or desire will lie in something that will help them establish an independent identity from their home, and the action will take place outside the domestic sphere. If family or home do come into the story, it's usually as an obstacle, parents, or circumstances that keep the protagonist from achieving her dreams, or interestingly, as stakes, where she has to fight to protect her home or family from threats in the wider world. So think about your protagonist's relationship with home, and that will help you determine her emotional age and whether or not this book falls into the middle grade or young adult category. So on to the next slide. I have two books, two novels that I love to use in my courses. If you have not read either of these books, I highly recommend it because they're just fantastic. They're beautiful, beautiful stories, but they also work really well as a compare and contrast of middle grade and young adult. 
They're both written in first person present. They're both set in the contemporary world, but with a touch of magical realism. And they both explore themes of grief and loss and what grief and loss do to a family unit and how it might fracture that family unit. So that's part of the reason I love comparing them is because they share so many things in common, but there are a lot of differences as well. In The Astonishing Color of After, which is a young adult novel, Lee, the main character, believes that her recently deceased mother who committed suicide is now a bird. Her mother's spirit is in this bird and this bird is following her around. That's the magical realism bent. In Hour of the Bees, a middle grade novel, 12 year old Carol, who is the protagonist, believes that her dying grandfather, I believe he has Alzheimer's, his prediction that the bees are going to return, they've been vanished for decades, they're going to return and save his ranch from this ongoing drought. She believes that that prediction is coming true. And that's the magical realism bent of that book. So they're sharing a very similar experience here of losing or having recently lost a family member. But the way they handle their experiences throughout the book is a result of their emotional ages. And as a result, their stories end quite differently. So there are some spoilers here. <laughs> Carol learns more about the contentious relationship between her father and his father. And in the climax, she breaks her grandfather out of hospice and drives. Yes, she drives him back to the ranch, 12 year old girl, and they end up getting caught in a flood. So she has a big adventure. And later in the final scenes, she comforts her father as they sit with her grandfather in his final moments. And the very last scene of the book is written in the same style as the wild tales her grandfather spun. And we, the reader, learn that she and her family are rebuilding his ranch and creating a new home together. So like Klein says in her book, middle grade protagonists acquiring independence, but still need the anchor that home and everything that it represents provides. And even when they participate in adventure, like stealing a car and getting caught in a the flood, they, the story ends with the promise of a return home to a safe space or their status quo. Now compare that to The Astonishing Color of After, where Lee is dealing with the death of her mother. And throughout the story, she allows herself finally to fall in love with her best friend, who she's been kind of keeping at a distance. She explores more about her mother's side of the family and her Taiwanese heritage, and she gradually returns to her art, which she abandoned when her mother died. And she ends up at the end of the book winning the art competition she was previously too afraid to enter. So her final scene shows her flying, literally on a plane, flying to Berlin to see her artwork on display in a gallery. So there you go, why protagonists are interested in the world beyond home, friends, romance, sex, independence, travel, the future. It hits all of those marks, both of those books. Such similar experiences for these two girls, but you can see how their emotional age drove their stories in very different directions. Next slide. So whenever I teach a course, Harry Potter always comes up when we talk about middle grade versus YA because people wanna know which category does it fall into? And I think this could be up for debate, and I'm sure some people would love to debate this with me, and I welcome your opinions, but this is what I think. I think that Harry neatly fits into both definitions, depending on what book you're looking at, with the exception of book four. In the first three books, Harry is learning how he fits into the wizarding world, and he returns home to the Dursleys at the end of each book. So solid middle grade, one through three. In the fourth book, that 14 year old dead zone category, he finally comes face to face with Voldemort. He witnesses the death of a fellow student and friend. He begins to understand that there's corruption and incompetence with the adults in his lives. And while he does return home to the Dursleys, this is in every other way, a transitional book. And then book five starts and he is angsty and defiant and we are just solidly in young adult territory. He leads a student resistance against the government. The climax of book five doesn't take place at Hogwarts like all the other books did before it, but at the Ministry of Magic. He is learning how he fits into the wizarding world and how he can affect and change it. And this holds true throughout books six and seven, especially the last one in which he only returns to Hogwarts for that final confrontation with Voldemort. So that's my opinion. First three, middle grade, book four, uh, who knows? <laughs> and the last three books are definitely young adults. So on to the next part. I get asked a lot, what, I'm gonna use finger quotes here, what are you allowed to write about in middle grade? 
especially in comparison with young adult. What kind of content can you cover? So middle grade is true. It is more restrictive across the board if you're comparing it to young adults. If you're writing romance, it's going to focus on first love, puppy love, holding hands, maybe first kisses, that butterfly in the belly feeling of having a crush for the first time. If there's any romance in middle grade, that tends to be the limit to it. As far as language goes, you your characters can swear, but the words tend to not be used explicitly with some exceptions. So you might see the act of swearing. I gave an example, dad swore loudly as he tried to fix the television. You don't actually get the F-bomb, <laughs> but you know what happened. Um, violence is a little bit trickier and it really depends on the editor, the publisher, and honestly on how you write it. An example that I like to use is the book Scavenger series by Jennifer Chambliss. This is a best-selling mystery series. It is beloved by kids and teachers and librarians. And the prologue of book one, that scene is an older man in a subway station getting shot in the stomach, I think, by two, two guys who run away and leave him to bleed out. I mean, that is like super violent and a really horrifying scenario. And one might think, can you really do that in middle grade? But part of the reason I think it works in this novel is because, first of all, the descriptions are not bloody gory at all. Second of all, the two villains who reappear throughout the book, the men that shot the older man, uh, their names are Barry and Clyde, and they have a very comical Harry and Marv from Home Alone dynamic. And that adds a bit of levity and comforts and reassure, reassures younger readers. Like, if you think about Home Alone, you could easily refilm that as a horror movie. It is kind of terrifying, <laughs> but mostly in my opinion, mostly because of Harry and Marv and how those two villains are portrayed and how, how the actors handle their characters. It's, it's a safe movie for kids to watch and not get too scared. And then finally, let's talk about issues. <laughs> as far as issues go, and I'm talking here about like homophobia, racism, all of that stuff, I believe that the decision as to what a child can or cannot handle reading should be left up to each individual child and their parent or guardian. It is not the job of authors, agents, editors, publishers, teachers, librarians to decide what is or is not air quotes appropriate for a child to read. That's an individual independent decision. One example that has really stuck with me, this was a few years ago, a middle grade author, Kate Messner, you might've heard of her. She is a fantastic and super popular middle grade author. A few years ago, she had a novel come out called The Seventh Wish. This was by no means her first novel. She was already well established at this point. And in this book, the protagonist is middle grade. The protagonist's older sister is struggling with an opioid addiction, which is a very timely thing to write about. And Messner was really shocked when her book came out at the reception. She was disinvited from a school visit she had schools return her books once they learned what it was about. And she was told by numerous librarians that they would not be shelving copies of her book. And she's not the only middle grade author that has had such an experience. But again, I don't think that means these sorts of topics are inappropriate for middle grade readers. In fact, I would argue that younger readers deserve access to all kinds of books, escapist stories about summer camp and pimples and friendship, and also tough issue stories that help them better understand and cope with difficult topics. Kids out there who have family members affected by the opioid crisis could read a book like The Seventh Wish and better process their own circumstances and realize they're not alone. And kids who aren't in that situation can read The Seventh Wish and develop empathy for kids who are in that situation. So my personal opinion, my little soapbox here, I've taught hundreds of young readers and I've read their stories and they think about this stuff. They know about this stuff. And I found that they are remarkably good at self-censoring and knowing when something is too scary or too mature for them. But they are also very curious and they want to explore these types of issues because it's part of their lives. It's part of all of our lives and there's just no safer place to explore what scares you than fiction. So that's my opinion about issue stories. <laughs> um, on to the next slide. I wanted to get into a little bit the biggest mistake I see aspiring middle grade authors make. Um, so 
The first one is the biggest one, reflecting. Mo many of the adult writers that I've worked with who write middle grade, they write fictionalized memoirs. I'm talking like historical middle grade fiction that the author is pulling from their experience as a child in the 80s, 70s, 60s, whenever. And that's totally fine. I wanna be clear that that's not the mistake I'm calling out here at all. There's nothing wrong with that. The mistake is that even though the characters are fictional and the author has taken creative license with the story and it's not a memoir, they're still reflecting back in their prose. The narrator is sounds like an adult telling me a tale from their childhood. So there's a lot of little did I know, or we didn't know back then, or in those days we, and while there are novels out there that read like this, they are not middle grade. There are lots of adult novels with teen or tween protagonists, like The Secret Life of Bees, Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime, Boy in the Striped Pajamas, Where the Crawdads Sing, so many. And there's a place for that. And it's absolutely fine, obviously, to write that type of story. But this type of reflective back on childhood narration, that's not middle grade. That would fall into the adult category. The second biggest mistake I see is <laughs> preaching. Teaching a lesson. You want themes, obviously, every novel should have themes, but you don't wanna be wagging your finger at readers. In my opinion, anyway, if it doesn't matter what you're writing, middle grade, young adult, any genre, it's much better to discover those themes more as you write. I mean, there's nothing wrong with starting out a project thinking, I wanna explore forgiveness or betrayal or whatever. That's great, but if you set out to teach a lesson, kids are gonna know. You know, they read for the same reasons we do. I'm sure that you felt this way when you were a kid, right? You just want a good story. You don't want a morality lesson. And these last two mistakes, they kind of both fall under the same category of forcing a certain sound and not writing in your own natural voice. So one would be simplifying your prose and your voice for kids, like dumbing it down. I am sure when you were a kid, you knew when an adult was talking down to you and I bet you didn't like it. <laughs> so don't do it in your stories. And on the other side of things, don't, don't use slang that you don't know how to use or you don't use naturally in your real life because you think that's how tweens talk. It's kind of cringy. And also it dates your book, which if you want to write a book specifically set in a certain time period and you're using slang to show that it's that year, then that's great. But if you're just writing like a contemporary set generally today middle grade, then I would avoid slang because it evolves and changes so much. And by the time your book comes out, things are gonna to be totally different. So just take care with the mimicking. <laughs> um, all right, next slide. I wanted to talk, one last thing, uh, talking about middle mar marketing strategies for middle grade authors in the super weird 2021, uh, 2020, 2021 climate. So you can probably guess from the photo in the background there that a huge part of this is going to be school visits and library visits because that's what's been by far the most valuable thing for me. Um, so in the next slide, you'll see um, publishers, they don't tend to send most authors on tours. Uh, only like the, kind of the top tier ones get that. So this is the kind of thing you'll have to organize yourself. But it's the good news is that schools and libraries love having authors come visit, especially local authors, because that just makes it extra special. Like this author lives in my area. That's so cool. Um, and for you, that one on one connection that you get with the kids is just it's such a special experience. It increases word of mouth of your book. And no, it's not going to result in like crazy sales right there and then but it's part of a slow and steady game kids remember meeting you and the next time you have a book come out they will want to read it no matter what because they know you and they think that's so cool so a little anecdote i have about that is is actually in this photo in the background um this was a school visit that i did in brooklyn at the very beginning of this year and these kids, this was a seventh grade class and they they were a gifted and talented class and they were voracious readers. They read my book, Spell and Spindle, which is a middle grade novel and it's kind of like a dark, creepy fairy tale. And they were super into dark books and they did not hesitate to tell me so. There was one girl in particular who told me that her favorite author was Stephen King. She went on and on about it. She loved, she loved the scary, she loved the blood, she loved the gore, she was just real into it. So they were, 
they were advanced readers. Now, right before this school visit, earlier that morning, I had gone to Scholastic to meet with my editor because I had a book coming out. It was actually supposed to come out this September, but it's been bumped to December because of COVID. And um, he gave me galleys of that book. And so I brought five galleys to the class and I was gonna end my presentation by donating the galleys to the classroom as a surprise. But <laughs> this book is actually a little bit younger. It's, um, it's actually fourth and fifth grade. It's gonna be in the fourth and fifth grade clubs and fairs catalog. So definitely not for gifted and talented um, seventh grade students. And I started thinking, oh gosh, they're gonna roll their eyes so hard when they see this ridiculous cover because it's got like a little kitten and these huskies and it's, it's just a younger cute animal story. And I, I got kind of nervous about it, but I showed them what I had and they went nuts. They were clamoring for copies. We did a drawing and to have one of them win a signed copy. And then they all signed up to read the next one. And the girl who loved Stephen King came up to me and the teacher afterwards. And she was like, I need to be first on the list to read that book. And my point is that if they had seen that book with the kitten in the bookstore, that's not a book those kids would have picked up. But they want to read it now because they met me and that made it a, a special experience for them. And that's that's just the real value of school and library visits. So on to the next slide. I wanted to share with you guys, um, this, is, this is actually copy and paste from an idea that I had last fall. So I did a school visit tour in Texas last fall. And one thing I learned was that at elementary and middle schools, book clubs are really popular. Um, so even before COVID happened, I was planning on doing a virtual book club tour to get pre-orders for this Scholastic book that I have coming out. And now, that book, like I said, it was bumped to December, so I haven't gotten to test this out yet, but I shared it with the marketing team at Scholastic and they were really enthusiastic, so I just wanted to share it with you guys in case you think it could be helpful for you. My idea was to send out flyers to librarians saying that for every, say, five pre-orders, I'll do a free virtual Zoom or Skype visit for like 30 minutes, like a QA. and a um, and then for 10 pre-orders, I'll do that, plus I'll send the kids swag, like signed book plates and stickers and things like that. And because I have another book in the same genre coming out in April, I could also offer them a sneak peek and do another visit then. Um, I also told them I would provide them with social media friendly images to promote the tour. Hopefully, I was hoping that that would do some of the legwork for me in spreading the news about this and you know come up with a hashtag the title of the book all that stuff i also promised to provide a pdf of group discussion questions um, for for the teachers because teachers like it when you help them out <laughs> a little bit there um so like i said i have not gotten a chance to try this out yet this is something i'm going to organize for when the book launches probably i'll i'll save it for january and um yeah i just thought you know now with covid more than ever this is a really great way to get get your books in readers' hands and get that so, that vital face-to-face -face time with your readers. And the last thing I wanted to share with you guys on the last slide here is, um, oh, one slide before that, there we go. <laughs> so there's this new thing that popped up uh, just a couple months ago called Talkabook. I don't know if you guys have heard of this, um, but I have signed up for it. I'm part of the network and there's a lot of amazing children's authors in there. And what they do is they schedule paid offer visits directly to families through Zoom or Skype. So again, you get that one-on-one -on -one connection. You can talk to a child and their parents in, in their house. Um, YA marketing plans often rely on online strategies like Bookstagram, Booktube, Twitter, and all that. And I'm not saying middle grade authors shouldn't do that stuff, but it's not effective in the same way as it is for YA because it doesn't connect you directly to your reader. It connects you to teachers and librarians, and that's super important. But like I said, that one-on-one -on -one connection with kids is just going to change the game with you. So talk a book. I, I just signed up. I mean, I think they just recently launched and are still kind of getting things going, but I'm hoping it really takes off, and I hope that that's a really great resource for you guys as well. And that's all I had. Hey, look, it was 30 minutes exactly. Woo. <laughs> um, and I would love to take some questions from you guys. I um, let's see. Right, just give me a second. I'll get myself back on here. Hide this one. Thank you. Wasn't that great, folks at home? I'm not sure why I'm taking on this sort of uh, teacher sort of tone to that, but that was genuinely amazing. I'd say worthy of a like. Uh, so if you're <laughs> And make sure you hit the like button. Uh, and afterwards, uh, I've been told someone tried to hit uh, your channel link in the 
uh, description below and was uh, spirited away from this presentation. Uh, <laughs> no. Just remember, at the end of this, uh, the link is going to be there. Uh, sign up and subscribe to Michelle's uh, YouTube channel. Uh, again, is it Monday and Friday you put out content? Yes, Monday, Monday is usually writing workshops, like uh, instructional videos, and Fridays I've been doing vlogs. Okay. So, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to drop a couple of links uh, to Michelle's stuff in the comments. So send in your questions uh, as we do this. Uh, I'll get to them in just a moment. Uh, I think one of them is a link to uh, the cat's meow, maybe? The dog's meow. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if it's funny. What? Like that. You like the title? Sorry, I broke up. Some Bunny to Love is. <laughs> we don't um, know the titles. <laughs> also, uh, also um, yeah, uh, Michelle is a ghostwriter here in Reason. We've had a lot of people asking, so I oh, really want to work with Michelle. Uh, can I get her to edit my book or to mentor my book? Uh, what sort of work do you do for us? Uh, here at Reedsy. So Reedsy, I'm primarily a ghostwriter. Um, as in, somebody has an idea for a book, they might be have some brainstorming that they've done, and they bring it to me, and we work together to develop an outline. And then once we have the outline, I write the full draft of the book, and that's that. So it's a, it's not quite like developmental editing. Um, I, I've been asked to do that, and I, I can certainly do that, but. I know Reedsy has different, like you have ghostwriters and then you have developmental editors. And I, I don't, I don't know. I try to stick to ghostwriting as much as I can. <laughs> um, so, but I have had, for example, I had one project last year where um, an author who was, who spoke English as a second language had written a draft of a book and she gave it to me and I went through to work on it for, for English, like to smooth out the grammar and, and make it sound like it was, she wanted it to sound like it was written by a native speaker. I've done things like that before, but those are kind of special cases. It's really mostly like people hire me to write their books. <laughs> nice. Cool. Yeah. Um, one of the questions that someone has been asking an awful lot uh, from Altered Atlas is the Warrior series an MG or YA book. Are you familiar with the, uh, Oh, yeah. That is classic middle grade. Okay. That has cats, right? Yes. Uh, I mean, anytime you have animal protagonists, it's I'm not going to say every time I'm sure somebody could find an exception for me, but it's almost guaranteed to be middle grade. Those are so popular. Oh my gosh. <laughs> my students just like that's that and Percy Jackson. It's probably two of the most popular books I've seen for fan fiction from like middle, middle school age kids. <laughs> um, what is the difference between lower and higher middle grade? So um, again, the age uh, of your protagonist is something to consider, just like it is between middle grade and young adult. Um, if you have a 13 year old, that's probably gonna tend to be towards upper middle grade. And if if your protagonist is more like 10 or 11, that's gonna be towards lower middle grade. Really, it's just, think about, think about like how we talked about the difference between middle grade and young adult, and then now take middle grade and even scale that back. Like they're, they're more, attached to home or the idea of home um they are the as far as content goes you're probably not going to see any mentions of swearing um there's probably not going to be romance i mean kids that age aren't ready for the first crush talk yet uh, <laughs> things like that um issues i think can still be explored across the board but it's just going to be it's just going to read a little bit a little bit younger and animals are huge animals are just really huge in younger middle grade the warriors uh, series being a great example is it possible to talk about issues such as self-esteem and mental health in middle grade books yes it is and please please feel free to do so i just i i think it's so important for for these readers to have access to these types of books and like i said i taught for for six years i taught at a nonprofit that did creative writing workshops for tweens and teens. And most of my students were, tw were between nine and 12 years old and I read their stories and they think about this stuff. They think about this stuff, they write about this stuff. They want to talk about this stuff in a safe place and it helps them process the world that they live in. So absolutely, yes, please write more of those books. That would be great. <laughs> uh, let's see, I know for child characters, it's not appropriate to be blunt how much sex can the adults have in middle grade? Um, I don't think there's ever really, there's definitely not explicit sex on the page in a middle grade book. 
I, I don't think any publisher would, would get away with that. Um, even like hints or anything to it, I don't, I don't think there's, I can't, I'm struggling to think of an example where of a middle grade book where it's even anything about the sexual relationships of adults are even implied. And I really can't think of much of any. There tends to be no, no sex in middle grade. What do you think needs to be done? Ooh. Okay, that's a really good question. I, I really think it it's deciding what side of the line your 14 year old protagonist falls on. Where are they going to end up at the end of your story? Because that's gonna tell you where it's gonna be shelved. Are they, are they coming back home? Are they rediscovering their home, recreating their home, learning more about their family? That's gonna make it still in the middle grade category. Are they branching out on their own? Are they learning how they can change the world? Are they, you know, going off on an adventure away from their home life? That's going to be more young adult. So it just depends on their emotional journey. I'm thinking about writing a nonfiction historical narrative. What are the guidelines for middle grade versus YA? A Texas example. Is there more to this question? Nonfiction, okay, nonfiction is not is not my um, specialty. Um, I read it, but I'm not I'm not an expert in it, but um, I would say you still it's still going to be um, similar in like the content that we talked about, romance and issues and swear words and things like that. How you handle it, that's that's going to help determine which which range it falls on. Um, the most recent nonfiction I read in either category, I believe it, it was Jane versus the world. It's a, about Roe versus Wade and, um, and it definitely fell into the YA category, like solid YA nonfiction because it pretty explicitly talked about abortion and things like that. So it depends, it depends on the content and it really depends on how you handle it, how you write about it. What classroom, if you were going to present your book in a classroom, what age do you see the kids being? <laughs> what what do you, you know, who is your target audience? I, I think that's the, the, the place to start. Can you talk about word count and appropriate chapter length? What should we be aiming for? And is it really different based on genre? Yes. So um, word count. Okay, I'm going to try to do this off the top of my head. You're testing me. Um, middle grade generally tends to range from... 30,000 words to I would say 70 or 80 max thousand words and yes sci-fi fantasy tends to be on the bigger word count side while contemporary tends to air towards the shorter side and then with young adult I would say 50,000 there's probably exceptions but 50,000 would be the lowest and then anywhere up through 90 90 maybe even 100 for like a YA fantasy but it's probably going to fall between that 50 to 90 range with like 60 to 80,000 words being kind of the sweet spot as far as chapter length goes honestly I just think it depends on your story and How I mean I've read books with super short chapters and it worked really well And there are some books with long chapters made up of multiple scenes and that works really well, too I believe that's a stylistic thing. I don't think there's like a right or wrong answer for chapter length in any genre Oh, thank you Becky <laughs> question do you have any tips, suggestions for planning a series for middle grade? Oh, I'm so glad you asked. Yes, I do. <laughs> Something that I forgot to mention back when we were on that Harry Potter slide was that another question I get, if somebody asks, is Harry Potter middle grade or young adult? And we talk about it, then the follow-up question is always, I want to read a series like that. So when I pitch it to an agent or an editor, should I say it's middle grade or young adult? And what I think is, yes, you absolutely can do that. And I know you weren't asking that, Becky. I know you're just asking for middle grade. But this, this advice holds true no matter what. Um, while agents and editors love to know when your story has series potential, because series are popular and kids love them, if you're a debut author, what they really need to know is that you can tell a great story from beginning to end. So the most important thing to focus on is getting that first novel in the best shape you can. And don't, I made this mistake so many times in the past, and I'm going to try to word it just right. 
don't make your first book read like a giant prologue to get them interested in the rest of your series. Your book one should feel satisfying upon finishing it. They, readers should feel, agents and editors should feel like they've read a complete story from beginning to end. Now you can end with a question or a cliffhanger that makes us excited about the books to come, but there needs to be closure to your arc in the first book and it needs to be a satisfying tale in its own right. And then you can talk to your agent or editor about developing it more into a series. That's the best advice I have there. Does middle grade need a happily ever after ending or why? Oh, no, no, no. I love a good ambiguous ending. And honestly, I love, I love a YA romance that doesn't get a happily ever after. <laughs> I know that's like an unpopular opinion, but like stuff doesn't always work out with you when you're a teenager. <laughs> More often than not, it doesn't. Um, and in middle grade too, I think you, you know, personally, I like to to end a story with at least a little bit of hope, but I don't necessarily need to like tie everything up in a big pretty bow. Um, I like a little bit of ambiguity. Um, not everything is going to end perfectly. In fact, when you have too good of a happy ever after, I think it doesn't ring true. And I think kids, pick up on it. They're very perceptive. Real life incidents very rarely end in a perfect happily ever after. So, you know, why should books? <laughs> uh, what else? A couple of questions sort of uh, picked from there that I sort of lost track of because they're going a bit too quickly. Oh. Uh, uh, I should have asked you this before, but do you have any experience with self-publishing middle grade? I do not. I am really, I've been learning more about self-publishing since I joined YouTube because there are so many great author tube channels that give advice on self-publishing. When I first started out writing, um, I chose the traditional publishing path because I knew I would have to invest a lot of money into all of the, <laughs> I mean, the artwork and marketing and everything for self-publishing. And I just, I didn't, I wasn't able to do that. Um, but now it's like, there's certain ideas that I have that I think Maybe they would do better self-published. Um, I will say, I think I think self-publishing YA has a better chance of success than self-publishing middle grade. Um, it's just harder to get kids. The statistics I've seen show that kids just don't read eBooks. They're, the sales of most popular middle grade books, the vast majority of those sales come from hardcover and paperback sales, not not um, ebook sales. But with teens, it's a little bit different, and with adults, it's a lot different. Ebooks are huge, so that's really something to keep in mind. And again, I think a lot of that is that um, school and library is just such a key part of middle grade, and classrooms still have physical sets, and libraries still have physical sets, and kids, yeah, kids just don't read ebooks as much as you would think. So. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, like the school tours and the library tours you do, do you organize that yourself or is it something your publisher puts together for you? I organize those. Okay. Yeah, publishers don't tend to, they, tours are kind of, they're hard, to, they, they take a lot of work to organize and honestly, unless you're already a big New York Times bestseller, they don't pay off in terms of sales. So publishers only do them for like their top tier authors. Um, but the good thing is that, or the, the nice thing is that school visits, I won't say they're easy to organize, but administrators and librarians and teachers are just super thrilled when authors just reach out and, and ask them because they know it's going to be such a great experience for their kids, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. Like I think one, one of the big th misconceptions a lot of people have, like, you know, when they decide, you know, I'm just going to go traditional, is the impression that the publishers will take care of everything. They're going to put billboards up. They're going to organize all this stuff. But it sounds like, a lot of the things that self-publishing authors, you know, begrudgingly have to do is something that you have to do as a as a oh, yeah. published one. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. No, the publishers tend to, and this seems to be more. It seems to be more and more the case every year that publishers just give most of their marketing budgets to like one to two percent of the authors on their lists. You know, the rest of us don't get much. <laughs> yeah. Do you find um, with? I guess a lot of people here are sort of vacillating. You know, they're on the edge between whether they should go MG or YA. Yeah. You find that uh, with YA, you do sort of have a solid section of adult readers who are happily, mm -hmm. you know, perusing the YA section. But as soon as it hits the middle grade shelf, like they won't look through it. Like, is that sort of like a real barrier? I, it is. I mean, if you're trying to reach adult readers, then yeah, don't write middle grade. You're going to, 
you're going to reach teachers and librarians, but they're reading to decide what to put in the hands of their students, <laughs> or you're going to reach parents who are trying to decide what to put in their kids' hands, you know. But yeah, I mean, I read middle grade, and I know some adults read middle grade, but generally, it's just it's nothing like YA as far as it being an audience. Do you suggest just calling a school? Yes, absolutely. I when I set up the Texas school visit tour um, last fall. I, I just cold emailed um, probably at least 30. I, what I did was I looked for um, library and administrators in my school districts because they tended to be in charge of like the more larger scale planning. And they would, and they would then, the ones who were interested would reach out to the individual librarians at schools. And that was how we put it together. Um, yeah, you don't, you could call, but just, I think it's a little easier on them and you'll have a better chance of a response if you email them and give them all the information that they need, including your honorarium if you're going to charge one and just a little bit of details about your presentation. And that way they have all of the information already and they can they can respond to you when they choose. If you just call and say, hey, let's talk about a visit, especially nowadays, because I don't know if you guys know, but right now it's kind of chaotic to be a teacher and a librarian. Things are happening. Um, <laughs> so I, don't, I don't think it's going to be too easy to get a call back right now. So I would go with email. And you can find their email hey, on the school's websites. Ooh, great question. Do I think that COVID might have had an impact on middle graders reading ebooks? Okay, so, okay. I have to be careful how I say this. Um, I... I was shown that granted this was like in April or March, May, I think so it was a while ago, but I was shown a presentation that happened at one of the big five publishers and I was sworn to secrecy because I was not supposed to see it. So I'm going to be a little bit vague here. Sorry, but the presentation was about how COVID had been impacting sales so far and what they saw, what they were projecting for the future. And this house one of the points that they made was that they were actually surprised that ebook sales in children's books hadn't budged. It had shot up in adult books and in, in young adult, but middle grade had was still saying the same and they were ordering hardcovers and paperbacks. So I don't know if that's changed. Again, that was a couple months ago and things are changing really quickly, but I just, I think there's just still something about physical books for kids. Yeah. I wouldn't yeah. be surprised if like library footfall has dropped significantly, but like mm -hmm. purchases for middle grade has gone up because folks aren't really making it to the library to right, right. much anymore. Yeah. Yeah, strange. I know a friend friend of mine had kids earlier in the year. We went to visit them recently and found that they only had like three books because where parents before, you know, be able to take the stroller out to, you know, a bookstore and like pick up a bunch of like you know, board books for kids, like they just hadn't had the opportunity and like they're not Amazon yeah. books. They just like had no books. Yeah. Uh, okay, um, I think that sort of covers most of it. Uh, that uh, a lot of it is sort of like word count questions. Uh, I would Google it. There's sort of information everywhere about sort of suggested um, like uh, word counts for MG, YA, and the sort of various uh, genres. And um, yeah, usually they have like certain genres are a bit longer. Like I think fantasy tends to run a bit longer than some of the yeah. others. So you could probably prorate that for MG as well or? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, yeah, middle grade does tend to be shorter. I mean, again, you can always find exceptions, but I would say, you know, think 30, 30 to 70 would be pushing it. Really think 40,000 to 60,000 for middle grade and 60,000 to 80,000 for young adults. I would say that's like yeah. the most common range for both. And I said that, like you, I remember going to a, like being like nine or 10 years old and this girl in my class had a copy of The Stand by Stephen yeah. King, which you brought in, which is like the biggest book I've seen to date. Yes. Um, Kids do like carrying tunes. Like mm -hmm. <laughs> those voracious readers, they're so proud of their big fat books. It's awesome. Uh, cool. Uh, well, before we sign off, uh, I've got a few bits of housekeeping to take care of. Uh, primarily with this presentation, uh, we're going to get a transcript made. So if you missed anything, if you want to see the slides again, we'll be emailing that out to anyone who's registered on Eventbrite. Uh, or who sort of got through uh, the ReadZ newsletter. Uh, if you're not signed up to the ReadZ newsletter, head to blog.readz.com and sign up. Uh, you'll be the first to find out about uh, our future uh, events such as this. Uh, we have another webinar in two weeks uh, by Christina Stanley, a fictionary. She'll be talking about book revision. Uh, should be a good one there. Uh, as 
for Michelle. I've got some more links on Dropout again uh, yeah. for the Dogs Meow. For, oh. uh, and for uh, Kudo Kids. And Did I see that one too? From? Kudo Kids. That's the one that's coming out in a couple of weeks. Oh, yeah. That's the one. Put that link in there as well. And I'll put in a link to the course that uh, on characters that Michelle has as well. And uh, yeah. Uh, of course, once this is done, feel free to go down to the descriptions, click through to Michelle's uh, YouTube channel and subscribe to that for more great and content. Ask me questions in my comments on the videos because I often make videos and the topics are based off what people have asked in the comments. So hit me up in the comments and I'll make a video for you. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and basically if any of your questions weren't answered here, put them in the comments there and uh, cool. Uh, is there anything else, Michelle? Otherwise, I think we might wrap this one up. I think that's it. Thank you so much. This was so fun. It went by so fast. <laughs> yeah, it was absolutely fantastic. Uh, if you have time, go back later and have a look at the comments. People uh, have I, been loving this. Absolutely. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you to those of you who hit like on this one. Yes, and uh, for those of you who didn't, I'll get you next time. But uh, 